So one of the things that we like to do at the, uh, at these events is uh, to show our sponsors a little love, and so they get a, a just a quick um, four, three to four or five minute um, opportunity to tell you a little bit about their company. And so the first um, uh, sponsor spotlight is on Streetline and um, uh, Ken uh, Joss will be will be talking to you a little bit about Streetline. Ken. Thank you very much. I've been asked to keep what I normally uh, spend about a half an hour on to three or four minutes, so I'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit uh, quickly. I enjoyed uh, Professor Shoup's presentation, and we're going to be taking some data that he's actually created. I think most people know that about 30% of traffic uh, congestion is a result in cities of uh, people circling the block looking for a place to park. One of the problems we try to solve with our technology. Um, a little less publicized is uh, information based on a study done by IBM in 2011. And we can get a 2% increase in GDP in commerce uh, from local merchants by reducing uh, congestion by just 10%. Um, similar, uh, a study done by the uh, Southern California Association of Governments shows that that same 10% con uh, reduction in congestion can result in 132,000 new jobs. So a lot of what we try to do at Streetline is to, uh, is to make changes that actually improve the economy, that help local businesses. Um, what's changed in the last 75 years since the parking meter was first, uh, uh, <laughs> first developed and mass produced? Uh, I would say, uh, you know, the car's a little bit newer, but uh, everything looks pretty much the same. Uh, we now have technology to make that change, and uh, Streetline is, uh, is providing that. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Very quickly, our product portfolio is divided into three major categories. First one is park site. Park sites for on street, where we detect the arrival and the departure of every vehicle. Uh, we measure occupancy and turnover, and are able to guide motorists to parking uh, parking spaces. Um, park Edge is our off street solution. So a city is a complete parking ecosystem. You can't deal with on street without dealing with off street. So we also have solutions for off-street. We can get occupancy of your, uh, of your uh, parking structures as well. And then Parker is the wayfinding, uh, the navigation system that guide motorists to available parking. We deal with all types of parking places. Uh, so we deal with parking structures, as I just mentioned, in Park Edge. We can retrofit old coin-op meters, so you don't have to have new meters. We put a meter monitor inside of them. They join our network. Uh, and we can see if they're expired. Uh, we can also do maintenance. There's a number of things we can do. We interface with single space uh, credit card meters that are networked. We interface with a variety of multi-space meters. Um, and we also deal with non-metered space. So we can instrument spaces that are timed in force. We can instrument spaces that are parking restricted and parking prohibited. So the message on this particular slide is don't think of measuring parking as only dealing with single space on street parking. It, it is uh, much, much larger than that, and I think you need all of this information in order to effectively improve your city. Uh, Parker is our motorist navigation system, and it's much more than just a iPhone application. There are lots of iPhone applications out there that take data and uh, display parking. Uh, Parker is a complete experience. It deals with on-street, deals with off-street. Uh, there's a map that merchants can embed in websites. There's a map that the city can embed um, and, the, uh, and the downtown associations as well. Uh, and we're beginning to talk to in-car navigation systems, so we'll see this uh, data everywhere very, very soon. Uh, we're able to guide officers directly to uh, potential violations uh, using an application we call Guided Enforcement. Uh, so what now we know, based on instrumenting a parking space, that a vehicle is occupying the space. We also know through integration with the meter that uh, the uh, space is not paid. And with this, we can guide officers to potential violations, uh, increasing productivity. Uh, park site is our analytics uh, application. Uh, has two major pieces. There's a real time where you can get situational awareness of what's going on in your city right now. Um, it's with generally within the last 60 seconds or so. Uh, so you can take a look at where the congestion is. Um, and there is a historical analytic uh, piece where uh, the city gets information, is able to 
uh, put in parameters, uh, times of day, days of week, um, and uh, there are a number of standard reports that show occupancy, uh, turnover, parking duration, a whole variety of useful information uh, that, uh, uh, that can be used to address uh, all of the things that Professor Shoup just talked about. Uh, you'd be able to use this data to be able to make changes to your, uh, to your uh, pricing. A uh, little closer shot of our analytics. I'm not going to go into all the details here since I have less than five minutes. Uh, occupancy heat maps are all part of this. Uh, we can take a look at turnover, occupancy. We can also look at enforcement actions. Um, and uh, this is just uh, what I call our shameless self-promotion slide. There's been about 300 articles written about Streetline and Parker in the last six months alone. So the media loves our ability to be able to guide motorists to available parking places. Um, that's, thank you very much. So now we move to uh, the first panel of the day, and this panel explores the in innovative approach to long-haul truck parking management using ITS technologies. Uh, at a time where um, freight mobility and uh, freight management is becoming increasingly uh, critical and, um, and, and a priority for the U.S. Uh, government, uh, this panel couldn't be um, more uh, timely. The speakers will be talking about uh, technology, challenges with implementing smart parking for trucks, as well as business models and research understandings. The panelists include federal, uh, California state representatives, uh, UC Berkeley researcher, and, and then the private company Parking Karma. I'll ask Susan Shaheen, the moderator of the um, panel, to introduce the speakers. For those of you who don't know Susan, she's the co-director of the Institute for Transportation Studies Transportation Susta at the <coughs> Transportation Sustainability Research Center here at the University of California, Berkeley. And as I said, mentioned before, she's also the chair of this event. Susan? Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks so much uh, for attending. And I'd like to thank ITS America for instigating this event and asking me to chair it, as well as all of our sponsors. And I'd also uh, like to give a special shout out to all of you that were on the program committee planning it with us, and we do hope we're going to knock it out of the ballpark today. So uh, this is one of my latest uh, projects. It's been in the works for a long time, so I'm super excited for us to have a full-on panel to describe it to you. I, I do personally think it's super cutting edge, um, and I think it is uh, very timely given the focus of MAP21 on goods movement and on uh, clearer performance metrics. So our panel is very distinguished, and I will start with introduction of Ed Folk, who is a transportation technical specialist with the Federal Highway Administration. Our next speaker is going to be Matt Hansen. He's a freight research project manager at Caltrans. Uh, Elliot Martin, assistant research engineer, along with me at the Transportation Sustainability Research Center at UC Berkeley. And Christian McCarrick, he is the CTO of Parking Karma. And I believe this is going to be a very exciting panel. What we are going to do is we're going to have each of the speakers uh, give a presentation for about 10 to 12 minutes, and we're going to hold questions, and then we're going to have a facilitated dialogue. And you can join us after I take the first couple of hits with questions. All right, with that, Ed. Thank you, Susan. It's uh, good to be here to share some of the stuff that we've been working on for the past couple of years. I actually do not have a presentation, so you guys have to focus on me. Okay. The latest National Highway Transportation Safety Report published in, in 2010, we recorded 3,600 uh, deaths on the freeway directly attributed to freight accidents. About 80,000 people were, were injured that same year. Based on our statistics, about 30 to 40% of those were directly attributed to driver fatigue. So truck parking is one of those high safety um, <coughs> critical projects that we would like to see implemented to help reduce the number of fatalities and injury on, on the freeway. So starting in Safety Lou, which was legislation adopt, that was passed in 2005, we developed a number of programs to enhance truck operation. One of these was to pr um, promote the avail availability of publicly or privately provided commercial motor vehicle parking 
on the national highway system using intelligent transportation system. That's what this project falls under. This is an ITS project, and this has all of the case history that FHWA has developed over the course of its history with intelligent transportation system. We're bringing all of that to bear on this particular project. So in addition to this project, FHWA is also involved in funding a number of other projects around the country. For Safety Lou, um, we also funded the I-95 corridor upgrade involving tr uh, truck smart parking along the corridor. Now since then, Safety Lou has expired and we've gone on to, I believe it's, hmm. You see, I'm a technical specialist. I don't keep track of a lot of these programmatic stuff back in DC. So a lot of these programs was a little bit confusing to, even to me too. So to follow on to Safety Lou, we also um, funded Michigan uh, smart truck parking, also facilities in Minnesota and Wisconsin. Now it's our hope that in the near future, these three facilities will be connected together to form the I-94 smart truck parking corridor. As you see, hear a little bit more about the detail of this. Information, I believe Professor Soup, Soup had a slide earlier, it says information want to be free. We believe in that. Uh, we want these guys to start talking to each other and share the information so that way it facilitates the utility of the information to uh, truck operators, owner operator and fleets. There's one more that I almost forgot. Uh, Pennsylvania is also one of the uh, recipients of the uh, second round of funding for a smart truck parking system. Now, um, unfortunately, we're now in MAP 21. MAP 21 has discontinued this, the discretionary funding program for smart truck parking. On the other hand, we've made additional funding available through the National Highway Performance Program, the Service Transportation Program, and the Highway Safety Improvement Program. The trick is you now have to compete with everything else, but potentially the size of the pie may be a little bit bigger. Now moving forward from this, this is the beginning of smart truck parking on the national highway system. Some of you guys may have heard about a little program some of the folks in Rita are working on called Connect Vehicle. Just a little program here and there. Um, we are working with Federal Motor Carrier Administration and developing a program called Smart Roadside Initiative, where we're gonna be incorporating smart truck parking as one of the type of data that we'll be sharing over the connected vehicle network, along with everything else that we can do over such a connected vehicle network enabled national highway system. So something for you to think about as you hear this, and think about what the potentials will be for the future. Now, my specific role here with this particular project is I am assisting the California Division in providing oversight on this particular project. My background is an ITS specialist. I've built a number of ITS systems in the past and I bring that experience to this to make sure that we have a successful deployment. Failure is not an option for us on this. There's a lot of other, the projects I mentioned to you are gonna be looking at this particular project to learn from it, to learn what worked, what didn't work, and how to improve the process. So with that, I'm gonna hand you off to Matt, who's gonna give you more specific information. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. Um, again, Matt Hansen, uh, uh, transportation engineer with Caltrans, been doing freight research for a few years now, uh, freight related stuff. So um, I'm gonna talk about the, just give you an overview of the whole project um, and then be touching on some issues that, that Elliot and Christian will then uh, give you some more detail on. Um, I think we kind of did most of the uh, introductions. Uh, Federal Highway is a sponsor. Caltrans uh, is the uh, sort of lead uh, project manager. Transportation, Transportation Sustainability Research Center and Parking Karma. And one person that wasn't mentioned that's not up here is uh, NAVTEC, formerly uh, Nokia and Keith, are you? Keith was here, anyway. So we had one representative there. Okay, just a little bit about 
smart truck parking and so why we're doing it and uh, we have been actually doing research on smart truck parking for uh, a number of years. Uh, I've been working with TSRC. We had a couple of very small projects that uh, we did the literature search, you know, looking at what was out there. Uh, not a whole lot uh, going on, at least in terms of smart truck parking. Uh, we did uh, a couple small truck driver intercept surveys. We went out and, and uh, surveyed them and got information about their willingness to pay and things like that. Uh, then we had the opportunity to apply for the uh, par truck parking initiative money, uh, which was originally meant, I think, uh, if I'm right at it, is more as an infrastructure. Uh, so they were actually wanting to build truck uh, parking spaces in different parts of the country. But we were talking somewhere in the range of $11 million, and when you talk about the country and actually building stuff, it's not very much money. And so we thought, you know, bang for the buck, what can we do? So we thought, what about better management of parking and, uh, and, how, and how to do that? So um, one of the first things we looked at, and uh, you look on the map, uh, the area that we're working in is surrounded by the little green oval, and then that's just the whole I-5 uh, corridor, and that includes uh, State Route 99. Um, and one of the things we found out up front was that truck parking is largely a privatized, you know, enterprise. Uh, there are a few, uh, say, probably average out about 10% of the spaces are public. And so I think that maybe differs from some of the stuff we've talked about earlier uh, with the, the smart car parking or passenger car parking. Um, and so there's not a lot of control. And I think one of the big issues with trucks is that there's nobody in the driver's seat, so to speak. Um, there's n nobody responsible. The truck uh, parking facilities, they're very focused on what they do individually or maybe even as a chain, but in terms of organizing uh, smart truck parking you know, or, or doing something about parking using technology and um, having somebody take the lead, uh, that was largely absent. Uh, so, because it's li largely private, there's some unique challenges. Um, we have uh, safety, both from the driver's side and hours of service. Uh, we have safety from the traveling public side, where trucks who are legally parking are parked on the side of the roads. Uh, they're parked in neighborhoods, running their their engines, um, which leads to you know environmental kinds of problems. Uh, the corridors, I guess they call them the corridors of death down in Southern California along the um, 710 and the 60 and 10 routes uh, where they just have higher rates of premature death and, and uh, uh, kids with you know, higher rates of asthma and stuff like that. Uh, mobility is an issue uh, with trucks if they're you know, parking in, in places and blocking traffic or just driving around. When a truck cruises around, it's a lot different thing than when a passenger car cruises around. And then there's the wear and tear on infrastructure. Um, at least I know on, on our ramps and uh, uh, frontage roads and stuff that, that Caltrans owns, they're not really built to hold a, uh, at least a fully loaded truck. And so when the trucks park there time after time, they tear up our shoulders. So, as we looked at this, and I guess I want to also frame it that when I think of smart truck parking, I'm, I really start to think of the bigger picture of truck traveler information, where you're trying to integrate, and, and the whole purpose is if you um, can provide drivers with accurate, timely information, then they'll make good decisions. And part of those good decisions would be, you know, if they know when and where to park, then they don't have to park illegally, and they don't have to circle around looking for places to park. Uh, there's a parking shortage in urban regions uh, near the big truck trip generators, either uh, railheads or, of course, the ports, or the, probably the number one. Uh, the reasons that I think we have a truck parking shortage is uh, primarily economic. Um, that just about anything you can do in an urban area, you can probably make a better return on investment than I think truck parking. The land costs are so high and trucks take a lot of space to park. 
Uh, the other thing I think that also happens in urban areas is, is NIMBY, you know, not in my backyard. Um, so the, the premises use technology, again, to deliver this accurate and timely information. And uh, one other aspect that is, has started to come up as we look at it, the bigger picture is the alt, you know, alternative energy and uh, trying to let truckers know where they can do plug-in. And for trucks, the plug-in's not for electric vehicles. It's the plug-in so they don't have to run their diesel engines to run their um, uh, cars to run the air conditioning or the heating or, you know, uh, power to provide their compu computers or other kinds of communication. And so we started the project. Um, so the, the phase is there. We start, we're, we're still in phase one. We have system engineering and deployment at two initial test sites. Um, we are out that far away from having a prototype. Um, then we would go to phase two, expansion of, to six additional sites, two private, four public. And then after that, then we'll spend uh, probably about a year, year and a half, just evaluating the system performance. Um, so our goal in the, in the truck parking project uh, was basically three things. Uh, real, provide real-time parking information. So that means counting the trucks going in and out. Um, in the case of you know, smart car parking, you have individual space counters, or you count the trucks coming in and out. But with trucks, it's a really different issue. Uh, the channelization doesn't happen with trucks uh, coming in and out. Um, so I don't know how to say the, the trucks when they maneuver, the parking lot, the parking driveways are like 100 feet wide, and it's really tough to censor them and, and uh, uh, accurately count them coming in and out. So uh, some of the things that we had to do for the projects, or the, again the goals, uh, reservations was another piece, and then the truck stop attributes. Uh, we had to do a lot of stakeholder work, uh, work have to do a business model, economic sustainability, and then I think a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about today are some of the lessons learned. So project status, where we are now, we've done most of the system engineering. Uh, we've done a system engineering manage management plan, a concept of operations, uh, requirements, and we're using the, it's called the agile development process where it's a, it's a modified system engineering where we try to uh, create a system and then break it and then you know fix it and then break it again. The smart truck parking system, we have a website, consists of uh, the website, a mobile app, and with the mobile app uh, we're developing text-to-speech capabilities uh, for safety's sake because we don't want you know, the whole distracted driving issue. We don't want uh, truckers to have to be pushing buttons um, in their car. Um, a database and then the data collection, analysis, and processing. Um, also, where we're at, so one of the things that we did up front was we looked at truck sensing and uh, we tried to find out where people had been successful using sensors. Again, trucks are really different because of their size and how they move. And I think there's at least a couple federal studies that didn't have very much success with trying to sense and count trucks in a parking environment. And so I think as a team we decided that we were going to try a pl plethora of technologies including loops, uh, RFID, cameras, laser curtain, uh, magnetic spot sensing. And so the the laser curtain and the magnetic spot sensing we don't have out there deployed yet, but loops, RFID cameras, and I guess video too, uh, both, or cameras both still and video. Uh, we have, let's say two, two up and running now? Yeah. So two, just about up and running, uh, Lodi, Santanella, and then we're almost there with Ripon and uh, the Bakersfield lots. Uh, then we also have Lost uh, Lot in Lost Hills, and then we have a park and ride lot down in San Diego, and the Elkhorn Rest Area, which is up in Sacramento, right across from the Sacramento Airport, that we're going to instrument and count vehicles, or count the trucks coming in and out. 
and then I will show you a kind of typical site layout. If you look at the, uh, the center upper right where the trucks come in, we tried uh, putting sensors across there. Uh, that didn't work out. We ended up mounting sensors on the roof uh, of the fueling station uh, and counting the vehicles coming in, and that's turned out to be pretty accurate. We tried to use RFID going across, uh, the truck going out on here on the left side, and uh, we were unsuccessful with that because the trucks kept running over our sensors, um, wh which happens, again, uh, if it's, there's not like a big <coughs> barrier or barricade there, uh, many times trucks will hit it. You can see that truck up at the very top, kind of white colored on the right, it's got the red stripes running into it. Well, when they make a right turn, they don't have a lot of room to do that. And so they will pile right over that uh, planter box, and that's what killed our uh, sensor. So we instead, we installed just uh, inductive loops in that location. And I think Elliot's going to talk about this more, so I will let him do that. Uh, this is just a picture. Uh, one of the difficult things we're having, uh, or problems we're having, is recalibration and verification. Uh, we tried taking a camera up high and taking pictures of the, the, the of a whole truck stop, and this was a 200 space truck stop, not not the one we just saw. Um, not enough detail in there. Uh, image recognition is not good enough at this point. To, okay. Not not good enough at this point to detect where the trucks are and where the trucks aren't are aren't in a parking lot. Okay, this just shows some screenshots. Um, the mobile app, and then just different uh, web web shots. So, to date, we've done again clipboard surveys, interviews with both truck drivers and truck stop operators. Uh, we've done a lot of research on truck traffic uh, along the I-5 corridor using way in motion information and um, automated vehicle classification information that uh, truck truck census kinds of information from Caltrans. Uh, system verification, uh, error correction and analysis, and again, uh, Elliot will get more into some of that. Uh, so our next steps is to get that prototype up and running. It it's, uh, has been a little while, and so we're very close, and I'm hoping probably in, within the next month or so that we will have the prototype up and running, um, and then uh, we can get uh, Federal Highways uh, permission to proceed with the, uh, the additional truck stops, and then doing the rest of the uh, system operation, the testing, the evaluation of the system, and uh, lessons learned. Uh, then just long-term vision, uh, national network of truck stops uh, that are connected. Uh, questions like how do we grow it, uh, like the National Highway Network, it requires both public and private participation. Uh, the whole issue of standards is going to be a big one. We have, you know, a thousand truck stops out there, and they're reporting their trucks, truck parking space availability uh, with different standards. It's going to make it a lot harder to create, you know, a, a system that, you know, it's easy for a trucker to go out there and see where they, where their, our parking space is available. Uh, it's going to take probably a combination of federal, state, and private investment and involvement, um, and there's uh, many key strategic relationships needed. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Elliot. And he'll talk about uh, um, data analysis. And OK, thank you very much. Um, my name is Elliot Martin, and I'm a researcher with the Transportation Sustainability Research Center. And uh, so I'm going to be talking about a very specific component of this project, uh, specifically the, the sensor analysis and how do we get the counts right. This project has a lot of moving parts. It started off with a systems engineering, uh, a systems engineering effort where we had to specify the requirements of what this system actually had to do, and then we run through those requirements, and then we test to make sure that it's meeting, or if it's not meeting, we identify uh, what the issue is, and, and then we, we work to fix it. So that's one major sort of foundational component of this project. And then there's the boots on the ground, the implementation of the project that uh, we're really, really uh, into right now. And two of the aspects. Uh, are, are really the sort of sensor implementation, the putting the sensors in the ground and getting the 
getting that information to the system. But then we also have a very, very critical component of this project, and that is, is that the information has to be right. We can talk a big game about smart truck parking, about the value of, in, of, of parking availability information. We've done a number of surveys that have indicated that you know, universally, yes, truckers do think, well, I won't say universally, 70, but, but a strong majority, 70, 70 to 80 percent of truckers believe that truck parking availability information would be good for, for them, for the industry, and, that, and as well as truck parking, truck parking reservations would also be good uh, for, for them. So, so broadly, the, the trucking industry finds that this, believes that this type of information would be useful, but converting that into an actual practice means that we got to get the sensing counts right, that the information has to be correct, and it's a hard problem. It's a problem that, that requires uh, ingenuity, it requires uh, adaptation within the, sensing, uh, within the sensing industry, because the sensing industry, absent projects like this, haven't had the sort of directed need to develop the, the, the technologies to do this. And so one of the things I like about this project is I believe that it's really sort of advancing the industry, providing the motivation to the industry to look at ways in which we can address this, this issue. How do we get these counts better? And so one of the things that I'll talk about today is really the the, uh, the analysis that we have done for just one of our sort of test bed sites, and that's Lodi. I'll get into that further, um, so that you know we can we can evaluate sort of what can we get when we get information that is working. How do we modify it? What what types of things can we do to modify the actual reporting of the system so that the system is, is reporting counts correctly? And and then uh, and then talk about some next steps. So it, it, initially, I'll just give some sort of my thoughts about truck parking sensing. And these are just my thoughts. Is what do I think about truck parking sensing and how does it differ from uh, urban parking sensing? And they are different problems. Um, and then I will, I will talk more about the sensors at Lodi and we'll go specifically talking about Lodi pretty much for the rest of the talk. Uh, Lodi is our test bed in part because it's so close um, and they've also been very cooperative, very welcoming to us and so it's been a very, very useful location for us to really see how would this happen uh, at, the, at the private sector level. And initially we did, we did we did this, this work at the logistics terminal, and they were also very supportive and very helpful in putting and allowing us to put sensors into the ground and testing the testing the the the, uh, the deployment and counts of the systems. And we had very very good information from there. It was very very encouraging. These were in, this was a one way in and out system, and and so in that type of environment, it was encouraging to see that we could get those counts right. That was really our first site, and now we move on to the to, to the Lodi site, which is more of a bona fide private truck stop. And that's an area where you've got trucks going all over the place. And so how do we evaluate that problem? And that's what we'll be talking about today. And I'll talk about the evaluation methodology, uh, the sensing data analysis, the sensor adjustment, and the error correction. There are two components. And then wrap up with the conclusion. So just information, it's, it's sort of an inherently obvious point, but information accuracy is critical to smart truck parking. Uh, sensors, parking sensors, I believe, personally, face a more stringent accuracy requirement than roadway sensors. Relatively small discrepancies in vehicle count can quickly add up to an inaccurate and misleading information. Uh, discrepancy for, say, a typical truck stop of 200 spaces, discrepancy of just 50 vehicles uh, from what is actually reality is 25% off. And that makes a big difference as far as whether there's actual parking or whether there's not at the extremes. Now, some of the differences between uh, truck parking and urban parking sensing really should be, I think, mentioned. Um, one of the one of the uh, first points is, is really also obvious: is that the vehicles are bigger and they're more diverse. You have to be able to sense uh, five-axle trucks. You have to be able to sense uh, bobtails, which are the trucks without the trailers. And the reason why you have to do that is because at a private truck stop, uh, the bobtails will take up a full space. And so, if you can't see a bobtail, or if you don't, if you don't identify what that vehicle is. Uh, or if you can't, or if if you can identify one, not the other, you don't necessarily need to classify them all the time. But if you can, if you miss one type of vehicle, uh, then you you're gonna you're gonna miss your counts. As has been mentioned before, the entrances are larger with greater variation in entrance and exit maneuvers. Um, and for most truck parking lots, there is no parking attendant and there's no gate. And this is of course a differentiation between many many urban lots, not all, but many urban lots do have a gate and they do have a parking attendant. And Unlike many urban lots, uh, most trucking parking lots never empty out and they never close. And so the opportunity to sort of reset your numbers or to get your numbers uh, recalibrated, as we say, um, really is quite limited. In fact, it's not even there. And so uh, if you don't have an ability to do that, either with a human or with a sort of remote human on a camera, then your counts will go off uh, if you're doing sort of in and out counts. And that's primarily what we've been doing here. 
And there's one final issue here that also doesn't happen too often in urban parking lots, and that truck parking often gets super saturated. And this is an example from one of our verification cameras, uh, from a recent verification, actually. And um, this is an example of what kind of parking happens at late at night. This is, the, this is the, one of the main entrances and exits to the Lodi site. And uh, you can see the vehicles that are sort of parked off and getting in the way of the entrance. And that's normal. That's how, they, that's how this lot fills up pretty much every time. So this, there's a super saturation uh, dynamic to park truck parking that needs to be addressed in the sensing and analysis and accuracy of the counts. So there are two current pro approaches that I see to sort of truck parking sensing. Not to say that there aren't others that will get out there, but main ones that have been sort of on the table lately have been spot-specific sensing, and you know what those are. Sensors placed at each parking spot communicates availability for all spots with a high degree of resolution, and then entrance and exit counts, counting the vehicles going in and going out. Now, some, some, some specific advantages to spot-specific sensing are what I think is follows. One is there's no net count to track, so you don't have to do any math. What you see is what you get. What's on the ground, what the system is reporting, is what it is. Uh, and you have precise information about spot occupancy, which may be useful. Uh, this is something where you can actually tell where the spot is, and you can go, to, you can direct truckers to that spot. And errors are also temporary. They do not propagate. So if your system is wrong, it's only wrong while that particular situation is creating that error in the count. Maybe a trucker is parked diagonally or something like that, or some other event. So the, tempor the errors are temporary. They go away once the situation goes away. Now, some disadvantages, in my opinion, are that errors, errors are harder to identify and control. It's harder to tell when that error happens. You have to be verifying the spot all the time. Uh, only spaces with sensors get counted. So this is, a, this is an issue with sort of the tr super saturation aspect of truck parking. Although what you could easily say is that if you, if you find that all of your spaces are full, then you're able to, to count all of your lots. Uh, you don't have to say that the center full, and currently, uh, for larger lots, it's generally more expensive, at least by sort of what we see. Some specific advantages uh, of exit and entrance counts include that all vehicle counts all vehicles that are entered and exit the lot, so you account for that super saturation aspect. The error causes are more easily identified and perhaps rectified, in part because you know where to look. You know exactly where the errors are happening, and you can identify them, and you can watch them, and they're currently less expensive uh, on a spot specific, than spot-specific for large lots. But some disadvantages. It requires recalibration, monitoring, and some way to reset. You've always got to be looking at it. Uh, and it's difficult to apply in non-parking lot situations, so like on-street parking. It's hard to imagine, uh, with all the ins and outs, how uh, in just entrance and exit can give you a good count. But it, perhaps it's possible. This is the plan network, and you've seen this. This is where our Lodi site is. And uh, part of the reason why we have such a focus on this site is because it's close. This is the Santanella site that Matt had shown you earlier, and that site also has an operational sensing system. And so these two sites have been an area where we've been very active uh, and, and with, uh, I've been standing on the roof of, of both of these locations so quite often. Um, so occupancy sensors at Lodi are placed in the street in the north and south side entrances, and the sensors cover uh, the width of the road in both locations. This is a, uh, a satellite view of the Lodi site, and these are the entrances on the map. These are the occupancy loops. They were placed in the street at the recommendation of the sensing vendor, which in this case was Case, um, because they felt that the that the movements in the truck in the in the truck move, in the truck movements were very very erratic and difficult to track, and indeed they are. Um, and this is the movements uh, through which the the trucks have gone through uh, can enter the lot. They can go through both entrances. They can leave in both ways. Uh, they generally go south, but they don't have to. And that is where our verification camera is. So literally, that's us walking up on that canopy, putting down a camera, and recording video, going back and retrieving it. And finally, we place recalibration cameras, which uh, are either right now near operational or, or, or basically uh, or operational now. I was literally on that roof on Friday uh, finalizing some of this. And, uh, and so these, these cameras are used to uh, basically provide an image so that we can recount uh, what, the, what, the, um, what the count is when we're off. Um, so how do we do the sensing accuracy? Well, it's quite simple. We have a video, and that's an actual shot of, of one of the cameras that points at all entrances. We collect at least 24 hours of video from all cameras. Uh, we watch the video, and we create a human record with timestamps for each vehicle uh, that we see, and then we compare that human record to the sensor record and assess its accuracy over 24 hours. Uh, the human record provides us information on how the counts diverged, 
uh, and we can diagnose what is going wrong if anything is going wrong. And we can seek to develop numerical corrections if possible, or advise on sort of what types of corrections we can make to actually change the, uh, the configuration of the sensors. And so we've done three of these with, a, with, uh, with through this process, and uh, the and Case has been very cooperative with us through all of this um, in in analyzing uh, what what the counts were at each each point. We did one in August, we've done one in December, and we've recently wrapped up one in February. And initially, the sensing record suggested that more vehicles exited than entered, and that was that was what was going on. Um, but subsequent corrections improve the accuracy. I'm going to show data that actually shows this. This is initially what was going on. The counts were initially trending quite negative. And so we can immediately see that, okay, well, there is a problem, but we don't know quite what the problem is. Um, and this is what the human record is showing, and it does make sense. Uh, you have entrances increasing over the, over the exits. And this is the net count via the human record. So this is what is the, the, the dark line is actually what's happening in the human record from noon to noon. You see the rise, and then you see the fall down to about, um, it's a normalized scale, so it's about 200 vehicles. And this is what the sensing record was saying at the same, at the same time. This was in August, this was our first run. So initially, we ended up at 100% team, 13% uh, error as a function of capacity. And so we looked at initially to say, well, can we correct this? Is this correctable? It doesn't, it's, it's not too hard to see that you can actually draw a sort of a line through this. And there's a trend that's going on, some sort of overcounting. And so can we, can we correct this? And indeed, when we look at the, the difference between sensors and human record, we see that there, that there was a systematic error in the exits, an overcount that we could correct for. And if we draw a line through that, then we can delete that error, and we get this. And so that's, what, and when we apply that to the actual counts, we get that. And so that's the kind of correction that we can get just by looking at this correction of the sensor errors. This red line, which I won't show the process for, is what if we what if we look at the error correction for the entrances and for the exits, and if that is systematic, what can we do? Now, in evaluating this, it was very sort of helpful to know that we could do this. But the sensing vendor also had. Let me back up. That the, the sensing vendor also was able to make changes that actually vastly improved the system in terms of its performance and overcounting. This is how we evaluated the different corrections that existed over the course of over the course of this period in August. And it's just an error in percent of lock capacity. I think this is a good way to measure how your sensing system is performing. What is the number of vehicles as a function of lock capacity in terms of percent, and how does that track over time? Because an error at one particular time may not necessarily inform you how things are going on all the time. And with the corrections, we can get a correction where uh, within 92% of the time, uh, the error is within 5%. That's pretty good. But what the sensing did, vendor did was they, they basically tied the loops together. So they took we had two loops going on two lanes, and they tied them together to make them one loop so that anything that went over either lane was counted. And that produced a vastly improved correction. And this is an example of what that correction looked like. And you can see that just by adjusting the, the system in, in a small way, there was a way to get this, uh, to get to get the counts actually um, very much on target. Now there's still a spike in, in, in activity that occurs from when there's a vehicle that's parked over the sensor and then a whole bunch of other vehicles go by. But that didn't matter because those vehicles are, are going through. Now, the, the, the sensing da data itself looks like this, and this shows what we want to see. This shows oscillations between 0 and 200, negative 200, because it's a normalized scale. And it's very consistent. And so just with a small correction like this, and with this analysis, we've been able to find a way to get this to the point where this can be recalibrated. We can let this run for a few days, and then go back and correct it. And that's an operational system. That will function. That will deliver accurate information to the truckers. And I said, wait a minute. I think I have an idea for something that's even better. And so I asked them kindly to do another change uh, to the sensing system. And I said, guys, this is it. This is going to get it. And that's what <laughs> So um, sometimes I, I, I can, I, I'm good with numbers, but not necessarily with respect to sensing recommendations. It, it trended off, and the double counts returned with the, with the two, with the untied loops. We, did, we sort of a combination of tied loops and untied loops, and uh, I was wrong. <laughs> Um, one, just, I'll get one little point about this, is that, as you can see, the sensing system itself is really just a double counting problem. We know that because it's, it's a matter of the loops being tied and untied. And so the trend of double counting 
is very visible. And so there's an error correction component or, or approach that can be taken here just with the sensing data. No human verification data required. And just by taking the trend in the double count, you can remove them and you get something that's much more reasonable, something that is within the bounds of what the capacity is of the lot and it's within something that we can definitely work with in terms of correcting. So the sort of the moral of the story is, and I'll come back to the conclusions, is that verification is a critical step in sensing technology and it permits the evaluation of error, allows sensing to adjust uh, and improve, which in this case uh, they did, and it was, it was really quite a, a very good result. And it provides a foundation for error correction if it's necessary. You don't want it, but you might have it. And so it's good to know that if you are in a situation where there's just nothing you can do. It's nobody's fault. Just it's a hard problem. You just can't you can't get the counts to always be accurate, and they're trending off very very fast. Then there are ways in which you can look at this and say, okay, there may be analyses that we can do to sort of remove that error if the error is systematic. And that's an approach, a second order approach, but an approach that um, is useful in part of the verification and sort of resensing process. And so sensing systems can perform good enough to allow recalibration to maintain accuracy. That's what we have now, uh, I believe. And, uh, and sensing systems that produce large and systematic errors uh, may still be effective in forming parking lot. So um, our next steps, we're going to be evaluating sensing performance at other sites. Uh, this was our, our, our sort of first private truck stop location. And recalibration setup and integration, and then get accurate availability information, uh, operational problems. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Christian McCarrick, and I'm going to be representing the private um, companies that are involved in this project of our public-private partnerships. Um, and I'm with Park and Karma. And to start off with a little bit of our history, um, Park and Karma has, has been around for about 10 years. Uh, we've done a lot of work in the smart parking space, especially uh, initially with help from Susan Shaheen and UC Berkeley, uh, Caltrans, uh, as well as BART and some others. Since then, we've been uh, involved in a number of other smart parking projects um, in Southern California and across the country. I'm going to go a little bit into about the platform flexibility and showing how the uh, smart parking has sort of evolved from the various methods and how uh, it, it evolves and turns into sort of smart truck parking, what the evolution is about. We sort of started, as a lot of other companies started, in urban parking and trying to solve those, um, you know, those challenges. And it turns out that smart truck parking is not terribly different from the other challenges of urban parking, except in a big way with sensors and, and that technology as well. Um, going on to a lot of other brands doing special event parking. Uh, in BART parking, we just recently uh, were managing all of the BART's parking. And you can see that smart parking actually and, and plan ahead parking can actually scale pretty well, um, using about 30,000 uh, customers at BART um, to you know, almost a million dollars in, in monthly revenue. So um, smart, truck, smart parking itself can scale, and uh, we're taking that, that learnings that we've done in the urban side, the special event side, and the transit side, and bringing that into smart truck parking, working with all of our team members here. As all of us have talked about, too, there's a couple of issues with, with uh, truck parking. And what are they? I mean, obviously, there's a national shortage of truck parking. Uh, trucker safety, as we've talked about as well, um, parking on sides of road, causing accidents, uh, tearing up freeways on the side. There's, there's maintenance costs, et cetera. Uh, there's idling. Um, there's uh, environmental concerns. And there's definitely need for action. Um, the, uh, the, the study of, of, of commercial trucking definitely showed there is an issue, and how do we deal with it? And some of the recommendations they put forth were, uh, one, um, get the information about what parking is available out to the people in a timely fashion. And also form public partner partnerships um, to get that information out and to also try to in increase the number of, of truck parking stops that are out there. Uh, obviously, you talk with um, the head of president of, of travel centers, uh, people spending up to two hours a day searching for parking, it's a major problem. I mean, especially when you have a regulated uh, situation where they can only drive for certain hours of a day. That's about 23% of their time. That's too much to been spending for parking. Okay, ask any truckers what they want. They want safe and easy and cheap or affordable parking. Um, it's a known issue. So this project basically came about to address that issue. And as we talked about, what are the steps of the smart truck parking project? Well, finding the parking. Okay, where is parking available? And then if that parking is available, what does that parking consist of? What are the attributes? Are there showers? Um, do they have Wi-Fi? Uh, do they have gas, diesel? Um, in the case of some of the new technologies, are there alt alternative uh, uh, technologies or alternative fuels uh, available at this particular truck stop? Real-time availability, of course, and historical availability for, for planning purposes. Um, the other thing to do, the capability to make advanced parking reservations when needed, 
uh, truck-specific routing information. We're getting this from a partner, Navtech. Um, you don't just want to go to Google Maps and realize that your your truck is going to you know go under an overpass and, and you know and get stuck. Obviously, we don't want to do that. Um, how it works. A little bit about of our tech, our network. This is a high-level view. Is we're sort of sensor agnostic. We're data agnostic. We're taking data in. Um, processing it and spinning it back out. On the next slide, I'll get into a little bit more of the specifics about that. Okay, what is the different data we have? We consider data either static or dynamic. And the static data in this case is, you know, we do site surveys for attributes. You know, again, number of showers, number of diesel lanes, a number of parking spaces. Uh, and then um, uh, on top of that, other amenities. We partner with some of our, our projects um, to get this data. And we also go out and partner with um, some private and public people to do site surveys on hand, take pictures, get this information, load into our systems. We also do third-party data, and some of that is static, and some of that is dynamic. And dynamic information might be everything from, you know, what's the local weather on, on five, or what's real-time diesel information. So if we can provide sort of a unified portal to get all this trucking information that they need to make informed decisions about their, about their, you know, what they need to do to their jobs, that's what we're trying to do. And now, obviously, dynamic data. Uh, we kind of built our system um, so that we can handle data in any format. We're sort of data agnostic. We can take data from loop sensors, camera, see, camera sensors, um, feeds, people dialing in through an IVR, uh, SMS, going to the website to do upstate, um, to update their counts. You know, we, we're taking all this disparate data, pulling it into our system, we're normalizing it, we're cleansing it, we're available, storing it um, into a nice, fully you know, configured data warehouse, and then being able to take uh, data correction analysis, like Elliot talked about, and apply that to the data that's coming into our system in near real time. Once we have this data, we're then able to disseminate that data. And I think that's kind of the heart of this project is taking data in and then getting the data out to the, to the parties that want that data or benefit from that data the most. And some of those people might be uh, you know, the, the 511s, the, uh, the Caltrans, uh, the MDOTs, um, also public uh, websites or private websites and getting that data out to uh, mobile mobile devices, and that could be our mobile device, it could be a state-run mobile device, it could be a truck stop operator mobile device. You know, we're trying to get make this data as ubiquitous as possible and providing that data through a set of sort of standardized open APIs to get the data into our system and our network and to get the data back out. So that we're going to provide a set of these APIs both through REST, REST and SOAP interfaces that can be used by states, cities, municipalities, or other private companies to take that data and disseminate it as they see fit. You know, it could be changeable message signs, et cetera. You know, what are we basically doing here? We're basically trying to give truckers the right information at the right time to make the best decision they can about parking. Um, we can do that pre-trip planning or in-route planning. Okay, and I'll show you a couple of the modes of, the of how we're doing that. As I mentioned before, one of them is the Smart Truck Parking website. Now, this is sort of our implementation of it, but by no means should the data be limited to just, you know, our portal. It should be disseminated out. But some of the things that, you know, we can do here is search for parking. Um, as you can see in the picture we have here, one of the things that we do that we get as a, as a side effect of these cameras is that not only can we use them to, to determine space occupancy, but people are very visual. You know, people like to drive by a parking lot and see is, this, is it full or not. Okay? So they might look at a number that's 122 spaces available. They might not know what that means. But they can look at a picture and say, okay, I see, I can fit my truck there. I'm going to park there. Okay? So sort of, and this information can be updated about every five minutes. So not only giving them sort of counts and how accurate they are, but also giving people a visual representation of what they think is, can, do they think they, they, they could be able to park here? You know, we also, again, provide other amenities, information, again, like I mentioned before, showing diesel lanes, hours of operation. Uh, in fact, on our portal, uh, we can show reviews of this truck stop. Well, like cheap gas, moldy showers, great Wi-Fi, you know, that sort of thing. Um, one of the other modals, information that we can get out, is, our, is the web app. And the web app that we, I mean, the mobile app that we have right now, uh, provides a lot of the same information that the web application does. And again, the, the, the mobile application uses our API, and that API is open and can be used by other developers that want to build applications based upon this data to disseminate the information how they see fit. Okay? Of course, mobile apps and driving, sometimes you know, they don't always fit. We want to avoid dis distracted driving. So we built our app around you know, UST DOT requirements. We're putting speech uh, recognition into it so that we can really, we don't want to cause any issues. We want to help the problem without causing any other ones. You know, we also support from a, one of the applications was reservations. And our system sort of supports being able to make reservations by the dispatcher. And the dispatcher can charge that to a, a, you know, a central carrier, truck carrier's account, or their own personal account. Um, so we sort of enable them so they can call on the phone through a, through a hands-free device and make that as well. Some of the 
projects that were mentioned before. I saw, I'm showing three here, the East Coast project on 95, uh, the I-5 corridor here, and then in Michigan, sort of the 94 product, project. One of the things to look at, um, especially in the California project, as, as is mentioned before here, is look at the disparate numbers between private truck stops and public truck stops. Okay, we're all talking about 90% of these truck stop parking is in the private truck stop operator space. Very little, little public information. So that becomes very important in rolling this out to make it a public-private relationship and that we really have to get the private truck stop operators on board in order to make this a successful. Okay. Again, we've talked about the truck corridor of what we're looking for from Long Beach through Stockton. Eventually, you know, if this becomes a national rollout, we're rolling up to Seattle, Vancouver, et cetera. I just want to talk about two of the types of, of projects we have here, the sites we're looking at, to get into the specifics. One is an area where we can take a, a lot that's not specific or not traditionally known for parking for truckers. So we're taking a resource that might not be known and now providing that information to these truck stop people, to the truck operators, to knowing that they have a place to park that's an alternative. In the other case, we have a, a lot that actually is pretty impacted. It fills up a lot. So in this case, we solve the issue of that trucker pulling off the road, finding out there's no information, and then getting back on. So now they won't even stop and they'll go on to the next, you know, the next available one. To Elliot's point, right? Let's just throw some sensors out there and you know, throw some data up there. How hard can that be? Right? Pretty hard, as Elliot said, but not insurmountable. I mean, we've been looking at data for a couple of years now to really determine what the issues are, what the problems are, and we're coming to a point now where we're able to say, here's kind of a commonality set of problems, and we're able to now come up with solutions for normalizing that data and putting proper error correction onto it in order to come up with uh, pretty decent accuracy levels for sensors. I'm not going to go into the two types because Elliot went into them, but again, we basically, you know, whether it's spot specific or traffic inference methods, we're coming up with methods now that we can accurately give reliable information to the truck stops, the municipalities, et cetera, um, for the information when they need. We've shown some of these slides already. These are just going into the video traffic analysis. And the benefit, again, that from the video traffic analysis is the duality where we can get not only um, parking counts from these traffic, I mean, from the cameras, but we can get actual images that are, I think, a valuable piece for truckers to see that, hey, this lot looks like it's a good place to park. Okay. One of the other projects that Pardon Karma is involved is, is in Michigan. And this is basically um, running from the corridor from uh, the Canadian border, eventually, you know, all through Chicago. Okay. Uh, we're partnering with HNTB with this, and we're working um, to get 100% of the public truck, truck stop avail, um, operators on board, as well as about uh, about 80% of the private truck stop operators on board for this. Um, this project in this, with the state is hoping to get their private lots on board by the end of the summer and up and running, and the f by the end of the fall, hoping to get uh, all of the public truck stops up as well. And the public truck stops, um, to mention uh, the points made as well, are, are also going to be participating in the connected vehicle initiatives as well. Um, here's a picture of sort of a, a, an example of the Michigan corridor. You can see some of the differences. Uh, it's just showing some of the private stops versus some of the public stops in this um, specific area. Okay. You know, th um, we've done some surveys as well, our, you know, courtesy of, of Berkeley and our partnership here. And most, what we're finding is most of the people are making their decisions about where to park in route. Okay. There's some pre-trip planning, but most of the decisions are being made in route at this point. Um, they're also willing... They see this information is so vital that they're willing to pay for it. They're willing to pay just for the information. Uh, in a lot of cases, the truck stop operators are willing to sort of supplement that, that payment in order to get that information out to the truck stops or to the truckers and the drivers um, to give them the information whether or not to come to their lot. Okay. Um, some of the data. But the one thing I want to focus on up when I end is that truck parking isn't a state-by-state -state problem. It's really a national problem, and a national problem with a national opportunity. Um, we're talking about right now about 300,000 truck uh, parking every night, and this is in 2007. As we expand this, we're looking at about 2040, and you notice how much of the volume is increasing. And the volume is increasing across every state line there is along the major trucking corridors to move freight. And the problem that we have, I think, is a definitely a national opportunity to work together to provide a, a system that works across all the state borders and not just these discrete projects that we have. Um, basically, the more truckers that get involved, the more truck stop operators are going to get involved. And it's sort of a feedback loop. It's a positive feedback loop that the more truckers get involved, the more they want. And the more truck stop operators want, the more truckers get involved. So sort of a couple of next steps we have. One, 
as everyone mentioned, we're going to finish up, launch both the California and Michigan projects and really gather as much feedback as we can. Because as we mentioned, this agile lean development process, it's all about feedback. We want to get the feedback, what's working, what's not, and from all stakeholders. Because there are some, uh, some areas that might be you know, working against each other, where some of the private entities uh, are some, a little bit against what the truckers want versus what some of the municipalities and some of the state governments want. So it's getting all stakeholders involved, coming up with the common core of what our requirements are, and really uh, cha making changes to the product so that it works for the best and moving it out nationally. Again, to, to, to wrap up, focusing on a really national rollout. I mean, I think we really want to work on public-private partnerships, especially with the transit and with the truck stop operators, okay, to rolling it out in the, in the national and the major trucking corridors that we have. We want to work on standardization. Okay, we want to work on standardization from data collection, APIs, sensor installation, et cetera. Because the more we standardize and the more each state can, can learn and build upon the other states, it's basically cost savings. You know, we can roll this out quicker, we can roll it out cheaper. And obviously for a trucker, having to deal with one system and one interface and whatnot through the all 50 states through that route is going to be a lot more conducive to them jumping on board and making this a successful implementation than 50 disparate products. Okay. Thank you. for you is about the institutional barriers that the project has faced thus far and Christian as you move to the idea of scaling a project on a national basis if not a border crossing international basis what do we think about those institutional barriers so what do we know so far about institutional barriers and which additional institutional barriers will we face as we go to scale this project well, I mean, I think there's there's a couple, and one of the things that that we ran into initially too, um, both in California and a little bit in Michigan, is that um, one of the hesitancies we had from a lot of truck stop operators was actually working closely with sort of the states. I mean, I think the truck stop operators care for the truckers, and they're really concerned for doing a good job, uh, but they had a hesitancy about sort of just letting this sort of federal government or the states come in and you know set the bar and we're going to do this and you're going to do it this way and we're going to take all this data and what are they going to do about it. So I think you know, one of the, the things that we had is that's why it's very important to come in as a private partnership ourselves or other HNTB or some other um, companies as well to really have the private side focus on the private side. So have the private side talk with the private side uh, and have you know, the private side companies such as Park and Karma or another company work as a mediator, uh, intermediary between us and you know, some of the public entities, because there really was a lot of pushback initially from these truck stop operators saying, yeah, I don't want the federal government involved in my, in my lot and saying how to run it. So I think really coming up with partnerships is, is definitely the way to go and to scale it out, you know, nationally. So. Any other comments on this, Elliot? Well, I, and, I, and I will say that, that, that once, once those, those barriers were broken, um, that on site, they've been very cooperative and very helpful. I mean, when we go there and we work and, and and we're putting either routers in a location or cameras in a location. I mean, they they are very, pr pretty much uh, open to to allowing us to do anything. We just keep we just keep them informed. So on the ground, we've had a very cooperative environment um, with the truck stop operators, and I do think that that's that that is due to that outreach. Um, I I also think that another institutional barrier is state to state, and uh, the, the 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 interface or, or between uh, states and sort of. Managing this issue across state lines, um, it's it, you know I, I think our uh, having discussions across state lines has been challenging uh, out out in the West, and we know it's been reported that it's been very challenging uh, in, in the East, and so um, those aspects uh, of having uh, sort of the states combine forces and. Uh, reporting to say a single system or, or, or broadcasting the data so that anybody can pick it up I think is is very important particularly with their own rest stops which is of course the facilities that they control so state to state discussions on these issues I don't see much of it as happening but um, but I think it's it's getting better um, and we're trying to improve that that component um, and then there's also the the issue of, of, of linking this to ports uh, and getting the ports uh, sort of on board and understanding how the system really can can help ports because um, the port problem is different and so understanding sort of what aspect of um, what what aspect of availability information where would that be useful to ports is a problem that that we are trying to to resolve. 
I would just say um, I think Dr. Uh, Shoop Dog had it right. Um, <laughs> policy. I don't think the policy is really there yet. I think everybody sees the problem and says, okay, we have this truck parking problem, and uh, you know, so we got to get to a place where we have <laughs> policies in place. This is you know how we want to you know we're going to run things and how we how we want to uh, make the changes and then go out. Just real quick here, I think all of those are extremely good inputs. Uh, and I'm going to point back to my closing statements in my presentation about the uh, Smart Roadside Initiative. That's one of the efforts that we are looking at, both at the Federal Motor Carrier Administration and the Federal Highway Administration, to help resolve some of these inter interstate data sharing issues, interagency cooperation issues. Yeah, it's a little bit far out in advance, but we have a lot of technical challenge. It's not just domestic freights that we have to worry about when we start talking about ports and border crossing. It's an international issue, and there's a number of ISO working group that's working on the same problem. So we have to stay coordinated to that, because we don't want to, for freights to show up to the U.S. shore and run into a barrier. We want to make sure that pipe is as open as wide as we can. So. Continuing the theme of scale, because I think this is a key issue for this system, how do we go about lowering the technology costs of these services so that we can scale it? Well, I mean, I think I'll start too a little bit. Um, one, from a manufacturer standpoint, um, I think coming up with a, a handful of technologies that we know that we can, that work, and, uh, that we've, and that's part of this project, is whittling down these 10 or 15 areas of technology down to say three or four types that work and then from in that case um, you know, certifying a number of manufacturers under that 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 will meet our needs and then obviously if we can make this a national problem from a manufacturer standpoint cost to produce items obviously will come down if we can say we're going to roll this out in 50 states well obviously the cost is going to be much different than doing a project here or a project here or a project here and a project here right mm -hmm. and obviously to go put that out to bid and whatnot and also um, significantly reduced price, um, and that's that's one area. Um, I you know I, I guess I, I would say that that um, from the perspective of of the sensing problem for all of the projects that for all the locations in our site, every site will be verified in the process that I described here. And I have to say that the sensing, the sensors themselves worked very well. They were very accurate. They were very they they were very precise in terms of the counts. What was actually the challenge was the traffic patterns. The traffic patterns of the trucks were causing double counts in certain areas. So the, sensing, so the sensors were picking that up. And so you can have very, very accurate sensors, which these were. Um, but if the traffic patterns, and it's, you can't, unlike with urban parking, where you can basically be more direct about where the truck will go, um, it's harder to do that. I'm sorry, where the car will go, it's harder to do that with the truck. So um, I think we're still in a stage where there's a lot of idiosyncrasies that need to be worked out with respect to uh, the sensing technologies. And, and so how do we scale it? I, I think that we still need to continue to evaluate what these sensing, what types of sensing systems work in, in certain areas. And, and then also to push innovation, to keep this as sort of a, a problem that needs to be valued. I think that personally, I think that the sensing, uh, the parking sensing industry is, is, is sort of just getting their heads around trucks, and I think it's been you know a couple of years running now. But um, just to sort of figure out what are the problems and how do we address it, then you got to get on the ground experience. All of this takes time, and I think with that, then sensing technologies, uh, the cost of sensing technologies will can fall and will be uh, be more easily proliferated. Mm -hmm. And to jump in again too, I think is that to, to jump on that point, I think it's the sensing technologies that uh, and the backhaul technologies at each specific site are the ones that pretty much of the largest cost, right? right? If we, if the state or a group of states or nationally chooses this uh, one a kind of unified approach, then, you know, you really only need one database and one network backhaul, you know, from a national level as opposed to coming up with 50 databases and 50 things. And that obviously will reduce costs tremendously too instead of having to bid out 50 database design RFPs and, 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 and sort sensing uh, correction uh, analysis, et cetera. Right, and actually, to build on that point, I just say that there there is um, 
there, there is, there's a lot of existing communications infrastructure already at the truck stops, and so we can work with that. And we're learning how to work within the existing communication infrastructure there, and that is, uh, a, has, is turning out to be a rather cost-effective approach. Imagine the, um, how this problem would change if every single truck has a built-in onboard unit that broadcasts out using DSRC. Connected vehicle. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's things that, and to that point, I mean, I, I think that there, there, are, there are ways in which there are changes that could happen that right. completely change how we view this problem, you know, and sort of that aspect of geofencing or, or that kind of Correct. Component. So let's pay attention to what happens uh, later on this year and see what the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration decides to do. Right. So final question for me relates to this issue of 90% of the availability of uh, truck parking is actually in the hands of the private sector. How will truck stop operators perceive this service? What do we know about that so far? Yeah. I looked at you. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I did look at you, Rick. <laughs> might a truck stop operator not be on board? I think too, Susan. Early in the days too, when we were doing, you know, we find a lot of issues even in urban when we started. Some people just didn't, they didn't want to be involved at all. And I think it points back to that one slide I, I showed with that sort of positive network effect, where the more drivers and whether it's urban smart parking or truck stop parking, it's sort of these. I don't want to, for whatever the late adopter sort of people are, I think they will eventually get on board. But it's a lot of this. I don't want to be the first. Right? There's some of that. I want to be the first. I don't want someone controlling what I'm doing which we've seen in the urban areas too, but now there's been, I think, a little bit of a, a, a paradigm shift where now even the urban parking lots are getting aboard like, hey, this is great. Right? Right. Where even seven years ago, they were a little hesitant to jump on board. So. Right. Yes, Rick. <laughs> you do. <laughs> <laughs> I know you worked very hard on this. Rick, by the way, is the CEO of Parking Karma, so he's, I think, the big force that got a lot of the private operators on board. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I will open uh, the discussion up to the audience. Gentleman right there in the white.
disregard any traffic that would be going across any lanes because they wouldn't be, you know, impacting the sensor long enough to be considered parking. We were also able to split out trucks from smaller traffic. We're in Florida, we've got a lot of RVs and things mm -hmm. like that. that Any well, comments on magnetic and IR? So, I, I mean, and that is the advantage. Of, this is a spot-specific sensing system, right? You're, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, that is the advantage of, of the spot-specific sensing, is that, is that uh, if, if you have that sensing over, over the course of the large lot, um, it, it, you, you don't have anything to track. It tells you. Now, if you have an error, you may not necessarily know about it. And if you think you didn't have any errors and, and it works, then, that, then that's, that's good. Um, we have found, at least within our, our review of it, that for large lots that we're looking at, the spot-specific sensing has been sort of much more expensive. And so we've opted to look for uh, approaches that are, are scalable in the sense that they can be scaled um, to, to sort of a, a large number of of spots of of locations, and so that has been one of the reasons why we've initially looked at um, for the large lots, uh, sort of trying to develop and advance um, the the application of, of counting ins and outs. But there, that certainly is you know one of the advantages that I highlighted about the spot specific sensing is that if it's right, uh, it's right, and you don't have to worry about this error propagation that continues to happen. It's a good point. And, and we are considering spot sensors for the safety roadside rest areas, um, or at least putting them in, at, in one spot, but we only have like 14 to 16 truck parking spaces there uh, versus the bigger lots, which have 200 spaces. And uh, even when we look at it, we're looking at having to use two sensors per, per space uh, because, again, Telling the difference between a smaller truck or a bobtail versus a you know full 53 footer. Okay, we had a, another comment down here. Uh, who pays to build out the system both at the uh, spot level and the system level? Who benefits and uh, how do you prevent um, uh, competing standards from rising and having multiple competing systems? Good question. Um, no, we, we don't know that. That's one we're of the things. We're working on it. Well, yeah, it's one of the things we're doing. We're trying to come up with a sustainable, you know, business model or business models. Um, we're trying to engage other stakeholders. Um, at this point, uh, we will be working with, you know, the I-95 corridor, the uh, I-94 corridor, and all those people that are involved. Um, I'm sure at, at TRB next year that we will have a meeting and we'll be discussing th these kinds of issues, again, to be come up with some standards um, or some criteria for how you know this kind of rolls forward and I, and I think some other question too is you know I think what's paying for it now is you know sort of federally directed money and some state money but uh, the the purpose of this research is, is a couple fold right it's it's really to determine if this becomes a sustainable economic uh, business as well okay? so there's obviously it, it doesn't scale nationally if it can't sort of be self-sustaining and sort of have an economic positive impact on it Right. And that's part of it. So there's the sensors and there's all that, which is an important part of the research because it doesn't work at all without any of that. But the other part of this is also researching through willingness to pay, what's the ROI for payment, so that you know, where do we do then go to get this money for scaling it out nationally? Because it then, at that point, really does look like an infrastructure scale up. And what's the, the ROI for payback on that? And, and it might be a mix of, at that point, federal and private monies in order to scale it out nationally. Right, and it's important to understand that one of the things that we have tried to help this project understand early on is to look at, the, take a life cycle view of the overall cost of the project. And that's why we have pretty good confidence about the ability of these type of projects going forward. And that's why we expanded the uh, eligibility in MAP 21 for this type of project to tap into different pots of money. The other thing that, that Matt's mentioned was there's pretty good communication between this project and I-95 and the TRB committee involved. So we're hoping that from that particular effort, they'll have a natively developed set of standards that will help the data exchange. Now, we still have federal roles on some of that stuff, 
I've been involved with our standards program on our side. So if these guys can come up with something on their own, I'm a very happy camper. Okay. I think we have one last uh, comment at the back. Uh, it's more difficult. Uh, the, in this case, uh, case, the vendor did have to go to the county, which I think was San Joaquin, and get approval to go to the road. So, so it is, um, it, it's another step because you, it's, it is a public jurisdiction. Okay. So I'd like to wrap up this panel. Thank everyone for their participation.